this time of any uh, partisan movements within the ghetto? Yes. Now, you know, I think that we all tend to uh, attach a precise date for all events, but they don't really, I think, happen suddenly. And I became aware of the of the of the resistance movement uh, in uh, after shortly after the liquidation of the of the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, um, they you heard of. I guess the reason why they became uh, known to me was maybe because I heard it at home. Because we did not know, but my father was active as a uh, partisan. He was not fighting, but he was, on, as far as my sister and I can now construct, reconstruct some of the events that uh, we reflect on that he was involved very, very early. And uh, we, we knew that uh, one of the things that they were concentrating on first was to prepare themselves. They had no, no weapons. Uh, they, they, so we know that they started um, to uh, uh, sneak out of the Warsaw Ghetto to uh, obtain, uh, to establish contact with, uh, with uh, Polish partisans and uh, collaborate with them or ask them for support and uh, to obtain, and also maybe sometime they had to gather whatever little money there was from the Jewish community. So in some cases, they most probably they tried to purchase. I wanted to ask you a follow-up on something you said just a moment ago. You mentioned that the, the fighters inside the ghetto tried to make contact with the partisans outside the Polish resistance movement. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Okay. You see, we were so completely isolated. Uh, there was no source in the ghetto of uh, obtaining arms to fight, to resist physically. So the, the, one of the first assignments was to gather uh, ammunition. The only place to gather it, to find it, was outside the ghetto, either by donations from any group, uh, any organization outside the ghetto that would support it, or by buying it, paying for it. So the partisans had to get out of the ghetto, go on to, uh, as Poles, on, uh, on the uh, Polish side, make contact with the sources. Th th there were no intercoms, there, were, there, was, there was no electronic or any kind of communication other than the physical one which meant always taking your hands, uh, your life in your hands. You went, you never knew if you'll return. So what they did, they used sewers. Another thing was that the buildings in, in Warsaw had attics, and they broke through the walls between, between, uh, between the, between the uh, buildings. So you had a network of, uh, of uh, really, there were, there were rooms because while you can get, you, you could get in, you could get almost every hall, every, every attic had at least several uh, halls, uh, one pointing this way, you know, in, in all four directions. Uh, it was like a street. The partisans knew they had a map in their heads or maybe even drew a map for all I know. So they were able to move within a square block. The blocks were quite long, within a cube actually, square blocks all around. When they had to go from one block to the other and they could not, it, 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 they could not uh, do it on the streets, 
they used sewers. And to get, they, they knew every sewer that was, you know, one, one assignment. They knew every sewer in, in the ghetto. And they, uh, and, and, and through the sewers, they would get into, into the, uh, to the Polish side. And then they brought back uh, the, the ammunition. And then they, then, then, then the act, then more and more confrontations uh, uh, occurred. Sometimes, you see, oh, they, I think they were more valiant than the Maccabees. They were just, they were just a handful of them. Not, well, very few, because there were very few left. And they really had to use a ruse. They had, they had to, they, they had to use a lot of ingenuity in addition to all the courage. And they often would lure them in, the Germans. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, there were confrontations. Sometimes they were provoked if, if, uh, if, it, if, if that wasn't the plans of the partisans. Sometimes they would provoke. Sometimes they would appear. Uh, the Germans would appear, and, that, and it was a response. Sometimes it was a response uh, to the Germans, and sometimes it was provoked by the uh, by the uh, partisans. Now I think that the partisans wanted in some way to send out a message to the Germans, it's not so safe to come in anymore into that little enclave that was left. So I guess at that point they invited sometimes confrontations and they ruled. Uh, they, uh, they used the ruse. They, they, they would lure them in. Now you and up until then, the Germans, well, there was still a certain amount of fear of being attacked because th there were sporadic times. But you know, they were very, they were very unapproachable because even I remember having the fantasy, and my sister and my mother, we shared it. We wanted to jump, but y you knew that y y there's always the gun between, between you and that physical person that she wanted to attack. So you can always be blown away. And th 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 there, is, there is no resistance in that. So, um, so, th so the Germans did have a certain fear. Now at this point, when these confrontations occurred, they were much more cautious. They could not, they were not total, totally in control. They could not, going into the ghetto, stepping into the ghetto, uh, you know, the buildings were not dense. It was not that every apartment was occupied. There were only, you know, you could be shot. They had the freedom, the, the, the partisans, uh, the, the run of the whole building. And if they would go into, if the Germans would go into one, so many apartments would be empty. They never knew where one was lurking. They sometimes would lure them up to, to the attics. They might start from a lower level, but lure them up to the attics. There, the Germans were completely lost because the, the, the partisans knew their way. This, this was their territory. So they tried to lure them into their territories. Now you know, at best, they had maybe a shotgun, maybe a pistol, maybe a machine gun. But you know, you know what they were facing, uh, confronting the Germans. So it was really Kiddush Hashem. It was really, uh, it was really saintly. And, uh, yes? What was the reaction of the remaining Jewish community to the, to the, the fact that Jews were, were shooting back? Relief. I'm sure that there was also mixed with a certain fear. I'm sure that, uh, I am sure that even the, uh, the uh, um, freedom, uh, the resistance fighters must have asked themselves, you know, the peril, 
it was not just your own. You, it, when 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 you when you volunteer yourself, you volunteer your own life. But uh, you know that uh, the reprisals were uh, were horrendous. Uh, you the, if 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 a part, I'm sure that the partisans had to ask themselves, "My God, uh, am I?" risking the lives of the few who maybe, maybe by some fluke will survive. So it was not just just risking yourself, you risked your community. It was not, un it was very common that uh, uh, the Germans earlier when they came into the ghettos, if they didn't like the way this guy looked, they rounded up 10 Jews or 20 Jews and killed them. So you always just existing uh, not only brought danger to you, it brought danger to your community. But there was a great deal of pride and a great deal of support. Yes. Did you know any other people involved with the resistance? You mentioned your father yes. had a role. Yes, and please don't let me forget to tell you about another role model that was very important to me, Mr. Shabatnik. Um, yes, my cousin Monik uh, was a partisan, and he came once when we were already, w we lived at that time on a ground floor, and we had the bunker below below us, and uh, uh, the way we entered the bunker was we had a powder room. Excuse me. And the whole floor of the powder room lifted up s so that, that you couldn't see any trap door. And. Uh, I forgot what I was telling you. Uh, oh, about uh, the two partisans that I uh, had close contact with. Uh, and this, my cousin Monik came to visit. He, he just appeared, told us that, you know, his whole family was gone, and we knew everyone else in our family was gone, and he was the first contact outside our immediate family that we had. I remember him coming and telling us about, he, he uh, was in a group on Niwa Street. Uh, I guess this is, he was in the headquarters, I think. And, uh, and, he, wa and he was telling us about, uh, we were ju you know, the, the heroic things, how they got the ammunition. And he was just uh, so, um, so committed. Then there was another uh, a, a person, a young boy. His name was Benya Posner, and he was a very close friend of ours. Uh, the, his whole family vanished. But then one day, uh, you know, the, the, the partisans moved around. <laughs> they were they were like like um, they would like magic little. Creatures, they would, you would see them here, you'd see them there, and they would disappear. And of course, there was a great deal of pride and love we felt for them. We felt like they are, that they are shining for us. And uh, he, 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 Banyo came and he told us too that his uh, whole family was gone. And he had some kind of fracture, whether on, he, on his, uh, his, either his foot, his ankle, or his toe, was either fractured or sprained, I don't remember. But I remember that when he left, we were very, very concerned about him. Miraculously, after the war, we found out that he survived and that he, w he, uh, he uh, went to uh, France and uh, he, was, uh, he attended uh, the Sorbonne, and that a uh, professor uh, used some uh, anti-Semitic uh, um, uh, expression, and he couldn't contain himself. He stood up, 
He slapped the professor and he said, I can't take it anymore. He left France and went to Israel and he, uh, um, he was a pilot and for, I, 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 he's still alive and he's fine. What happened to Monique? Monique, we never heard from him anymore. That was the end. Oh, and now Mr. Shabatnik. Uh, one day, now, the, the, the bankers were, were, were oh, there and they were ready, but we did not live it in them uh, because we were still working. But this was, we knew that our existence was temporary. I mean, our legal existence was temporary. So this was reserved for when, uh, when uh, all the last few streets in Warsaw are cleaned of, uh, of Jews. And one morning, the door opens up and two assessment walk in was early in the morning. We thought that was the end. And Mr. Shabatnik, he's, uh, um, he was with us. He was in the bunker with us. I mean, in, uh, he was, when I say he was in the bunker, he was a member of those uh, because the bunker was shared with a larger group. I think that most of his family either were hiding somewhere else or, uh, or they, they might have already been killed. The Germans singled him out and they took him with, uh, with him. And, uh, and after they left, we quickly jumped into the bunkers. They took Mr. Shabatnik and they uh, asked him, they, they made him go from apartment to apartment. See, they were afraid to, uh, to barge into an apartment. And they told him to knock on the door and to say to the people, I open the door, it's safe, it's a Jew. Well, he told them, even Polish or in Yiddish, don't open the door. It, because uh, it, 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 there are two Germans, save yourselves, don't hide. And, well, uh, the Germans kind of sensed, you know, there must be some, because all they got from all the knocking on the doors was silence. And they knew that there must be, that there are more Jews there. So they started to beat him. And they, beat his head to a pulp. He never ever ceased to say the same thing. He came, he was beyond recognition. His, uh, his blood was oozing from his eyes, from his ears, from his nose. He was all chopped up. And yet he felt good. So that's where my role models came from. Was that gentleman your father's friend that you yes, referred to before? Yes, yes, yes. When you were in the bunkers already, what did the Germans do? Or how did they find the bunkers? Okay. Now, when, uh, when uh, the um, partisans made themselves more known, uh, the, the Germans uh, increase their their um, their cruelty, their attacks, and they they uh, they they, they um, there were more frequent confrontations. Um, I forgot what you asked me. I asked you how they found the bunkers. Right now, at the same time. They, the, they saved a, a, some, there was one particular little boy that we saw who was roaming, who was roaming in the basements because people were starting to build uh, bunkers and so you, you could see him roaming on the ground and he would disappear. Well, we knew who he was, but what can you do? We kind of were suspicious. He can't kill a child. Uh, we, ne we never, uh, and uh, so there were some people, uh, a few people, and they didn't need many, 
who apparently communicated to the to the Germans where the bankers were. Now I am not sure that every bunker that was broken into, that was that was ripped open, was because they knew where they were going, the Germans. You see, what happened was that the Germans intensified their vigilance. They start, they snuffed out every Jewish life, every partisan, and, and so they became even more violent. So for all I know, you know, that was a basement, uh, you just threw a grenade. However, I think that they threw, when they entered our bunker, they threw the grenade in the precise uh, spot where the entrance was. But I do remember, well, th then you had these constant attacks and they tried to snuff out all the life and then we went into the bunkers. Then, then our existence was completely subterranean. Now I remember that when we came into our bunkers, there were the partisans. We had no idea that they were meeting, that it was a meeting place, and I think it was the Hoffman uh, shop, I think they called them. But, you know, I, I, am, I don't remember whether the names are correct or not, but there they were. While my father shared so much with us, uh, he did not, we, we had no idea. I don't know if my mother even knew about it. But there they were. Yes. When you went underground, yes. What was left of the building above you? It was. Uh, see, okay. At that time, I, if you would walk into the Warsaw Ghetto, you would see an awful lot of emptiness, a haunting emptiness, and a haunting st quietness. It was a no man's land. There, there were many buildings that were demolished. There were many buildings that were burned out, but empty, staring emptiness. There, it, it, but the building that we were in was not touched yet. Now, I know what we used for fuel. We would, uh, throughout that time, there was no way for us to obtain anything really outside. There was no uh, any supplies for existence. But for fuels, we used we used to call it uh, shabrovac. We would go into uh, we used furniture from the buildings, furniture doors. Uh, my parents were so proud of me how well I used the axe to chop. The, to break a door down uh, for fuel, um, so we used that. So yes, we were, and, and really, a, a lot of our existence just to, to to survive. Our survival depended on the resources, and and that building as meager and as there was a, and as as meaningless as it was, but some like wood furniture that we could use for fuel was, was very important. What did you eat? There was very little to eat, very little. But you see, everything is relative. If you ask me what did you eat, I don't remember, and it doesn't matter because there were other things at that point that bothered me much more. But certainly there wasn't enough food. We had some food in the bunkers. The bunkers were very, very well equipped. We had, uh, uh, we had um, uh, a, 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 um, a battery run lights. We uh, had a battery run uh, uh, I, I, I think a, a, a lot, I don't recall all the details, but it, there was provision made for water. I don't even remember how, and I don't remember how we, it was probably like building a bunker so that uh, for the atom bomb to protect yourself from the atom bomb. It, it probably, a lot of the preparation was more hope than, uh, than in reality uh, it would, uh, uh, the, suitable for survival, but um, 
so, 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 so what was happening was, oh, so we were in the bunkers. And finally, now we were for a, a very short time, that was April 1943, and this was the full-fledged uh, uh, um, uh, uprising where things came to a head, where the Germans uh, decided we're going to snap every bit of life out. And the last I remember was that a grenade was thrown into that opening and there the Germans came down. I remember the explosion. I remember the panic. Uh, I lost my voice. My, uh, uh, my, uh, my uh, throat kind of swelled up. Uh, and we were dragged out. And at that time, everything around us was, was absolute hell. It was absolute Valhalla. Ev every building, every it, it was it, everything was detonated around us. The the, the the flames, the flames and the smoke, uh, went touched the heavens. We walked over over the crumbled. We we our, we the, we watched our 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 buildings feeding the flames. And they took us then to Umschlagplatz, uh, and they loaded us into the uh, um, freight trains, box trains. I don't know if they were cattle trains, but they certainly looked like it. And at this Umschlagplatz, you had this little remainder of the, of, of, of the community in such fright. And you know, I, I remember when we walked into the when they when they pushed us and. and and of course, the whips and 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 insults and slaps and kicks and and shouts, rouse you and rouse drag, uh, which means waste, and uh, and we were pushed into the freight cars. And I remember looking out of the freight cars. The 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 sounds, the the sights. And, 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 and the flames were just so enormous. It, it, it was just, it was, and, and the, it, there was a, a, a prism of, of, of hues of, of the fires that, that went all the way up from the ground and just into the sky. In a way, it it, it, it was it, it was not like like reality. I, I don't I don't think you could capture it on a movie. These flames licking the skies and and, and the smoke, ev every every hue, every range of color, and there they shot us into into the into the freight cars, very dense, choking. Our lips were parched, um, and uh, they and and. They were shooting, shooting into the trains. I remember how we clung to my mother and father, the three of us clung to one another. And those who survived the shooting into the cars uh, were dumped off in Majdanek. 